Greetings, friends. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I, um, I won't hide it. I'll, I'll just simply own it that I am tired. <laughs> it has been a long 24 hours, and I come to the pulpit in this moment um, needy and weak. And the fact of the matter is, I and we are always needy. We are always weak. It's just that sometimes we're more aware. And so that's a, that's a good place to be right now. Father, in my weakness, in all of our weakness, in our weariness, may Jesus Christ be seen to be the sufficient and mighty Savior that he is. Come and teach us now from this text. We have one verse that we want to understand and get inside of and then see if we can tie it to the rest of the New Testament for, for it to come a little clearer to us and then help us to apply these things to our lives. Holy Spirit, we need you. Uh, we desperately lean on you right now to make sense of this text and to meet our Savior in these moments. So come and provide that now, we pray for Jesus' sake and for the forward motion of our mission in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, after nine consecutive weeks of not gathering as a fellowship for the purposes of public corporate worship of our Lord Jesus Christ, less than 48 hours ago, we all received some startling and what appeared to be on the front end of it very hopeful news. Midday on Friday, President Donald Trump called an abrupt press briefing that lasted just over two minutes, if memory serves, where he declared, quote, houses of worship are essential. They are essential places that provide essential services. Furthermore, our president proclaimed on Friday that some governors have deemed liquor stores and abortion clinics as essential, but have left our churches and our houses of worship out, and that's not right. And then he said, I'm correcting this injustice and calling houses of worship essential. I'm calling upon governors to allow churches and places of worship to open right now now. And then summarizing his comments, he said, the governors had to do, have to do the right thing and allow these very important essential places of faith to open right now for this weekend. And if they don't, I will override the governors. In America, we need more prayer, not less. And then with a few other very brief comments, the president ended his address, turned and walked off, leaving his staff to respond to a room full of hungry reporters and other media personnel. Needless to say, the president's words were unexpected and they did at the time provide a glimmer of hope. In fact, more than a glimmer of hope. These particular words coming from this particular person, the person who is the single most powerful human being on the planet, provided not just a glimmer of hope, but a flamethrower of hope for all churches, all religious gatherings throughout our nation. At the same time, it's also true to say that his announcement raised just as many questions as it answered, if not more. For example, does a sitting president have the authority to override an executive order issued by a state governor? In addition, how will our state's governor, Governor Tim Walz, respond to the president's order? Furthermore, what will be the direction offered to us by the leadership of the Evangelical Free Church of America, and more specifically, the North Central District, the NCD of which we are a part? Finally, do we have the requisite 
ability in, inside of 48 hours time to plan and prepare for and host what by any conservative estimate would have to be regarded as the most atypical worship gathering in the 76 year history of this local fellowship. Well, by now we know the answers to those four questions, as well as the degree to which we can honestly say that the president's announcement provided any source of genuine hope for worshiping together this Lord's Day. Does a sitting president have authority to override the executive order issued by a state governor? Well, according to Fox senior judicial analyst Andrew Napolitano, quote, in a word, no. As ill-advised as these gubernatorial orders are, as essential as is the right to worship, as fundamental as it is, as absolutely protected by the First Amendment as it is, the president does not have any authority to override the governors. And then he said, I'll tell you what he can do. The president can dispatch a department, the Department of Justice to file lawsuits in federal courts and judges can override the governors. But the president on his own, no matter how well-intended he may be, and he says, I, I believe he is well-intended here, the president is without authority to do that. So our hope diminishes slightly. And then we come to the next question. How will our state's governor respond to the president's order? Answer, well, starting this Wednesday, Minnesota churches are permitted to gather in their buildings, provided that they do so at no greater than 25% capacity, which in view of last week's statewide news is a huge leap forward. At the same time, our hope for meeting today, this Lord's Day, begins to flicker out even more. Now, thankfully, our church is not an island unto itself. We are a part of a national movement, the Evangelical Free Church of America, the EFCA, as well as a statewide coalition of interdependent free churches, the North Central District, the MCD. And so we have wondered what will be the direction offered by the leadership of the NCD as well as the broader EFCA. And what we've been told is that the district office is wisely and I think commendably taking the weekend to pray and reflect over how they will seek to advise us by Wednesday of this upcoming week. And just anecdotally, that, that certainly sounds fair to me. Uh, taking an extra handful of days to prayerfully ponder whether or not our district leadership will seek to actively encourage over 150 free churches to engage in civil disobedience is reasonable to your pastors and elders. Nevertheless, it, it all but extinguishes our hope for meeting together today. And then finally, we needed to ask, do we have the requisite ability in less than 48 hours to plan and prepare for and host what has got to be the most atypical worship gathering in the history of our church? And there again, sadly, the answer is, well, no. Not if we love you. Not if we love our surrounding community. We could not have been ready to gather this Sunday, even if we felt it was prudent to do so in light of these extraordinary circumstances. And with that, our hope for gathering this Sunday, which had such prospects, such potential, such possibility on Friday afternoon, utterly vanished inside of 24 hours. You know, depending upon where we place it, our hope can be like that. As it says in Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. If our dashed desires after what are now 10 consecutive Sundays, if our dashed desires to gather together as one body in Christ on the Lord's Day doesn't qualify as a hope deferred, I don't know what does. Now, meeting together as a local church for gathered worship on the Lord's Day isn't the only thing that we hope for in our lives. 
It's a good thing. It may be among the very best of things, but it's not the only thing. We tend to hope a lot. From substantive things down to rather silly things. We are a hopelessly hopeful people. We hope our health will hold out. We hope our marriages will hang on. We hope our kids will grow up in the right way. We hope to be someone when we grow up. We hope for financial security. We hope for relational reconciliation. We hope for the Vikings to win a Super Bowl one of these days. We hope people will like our social media posts. We hope Scotty B's will be open for brunch some Sunday soon. We hope, we hope, we hope. But I'll tell you this, if your ultimate hope is in anything less than the blessed hope, raise your standards for what is worthy of hope. And if you take nothing else with you from this sermon today, I would want it to be this sentence. If your ultimate hope is in anything less than the blessed hope, raise your standards for what is worthy of hope. If you haven't done so already, I'd like to invite you to open a Bible to Titus chapter 2, verse 13. New Testament letter of Paul to Titus chapter 2, verse 13. This morning, once again, it's our privilege to take up this single sentence in Paul's letter to Titus. We began last week with the first part of the sentence featured in verses 11 and 12. And Lord willing, we plan next week to complete our study of this sentence in verse 14. But today we find ourselves smack in the middle of what is, in my judgment anyway, one of the most glorious sentences in the New Testament. So we are unapologetically taking our time. Beginning back in chapter, 12, or chapter 2, verse 11, we read, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. That was last week's text. Here's this week's text. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. By the way, I don't have plans to take it up later in the sermon, so allow me to simply say it right now in passing, that according to Titus 2.13, Jesus is God. He is God. The grammar here doesn't yield any other honest conclusion. He is our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was C.S. Lewis who said, you can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and call him a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being merely a good human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Titus 2.13, waiting for our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice, too, that the blessed hope is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus. In other words, these aren't two different realities here. The blessed hope is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior. This will pay some dividends as we study in just a few moments the relationship between the rapture and the tribulation. They're the same event, according to Titus 2.13, the glorious appearing and the blessed hope. Now, before we get to three practical applications of the truth in front of us today, let's take an initial look at this verse in order to get our bearings. 
When Paul says that we as believers are waiting for our blessed hope, notice that phrase waiting for in verse 13. It, it's linked to the sort of lives that we ought to be living up in verse 12. By God's grace, we're to be living certain kinds of lives according to verse 12. So that when Paul says in verse 13 that we're waiting, waiting is what marks our lives in the present age according to verse 12. Christians who love Jesus, who follow Jesus, who live for Jesus. Christians are a people who, at the end of the day, are a waiting people. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul offers what has got to be one of the most succinct descriptions of the Christian life in, in his writings. So Paul says to the church in Thessalonica, to the answer, to the question, what is a Christian? Here's Paul's answer, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. We tend to have a love-hate relationship with waiting, don't we? It's mainly hate, I think. We Americans don't wait particularly well. How many of us would say that we wait well? So it's probably a good idea for us to consider for a moment the kind of waiting that Paul has, has in mind here. The word waiting found in verse 13 is found in multiple places in the New Testament. And when we find it, we discover that it means a whole heck of a lot more than just sitting around playing Candy Crush on your phone at the DMV or killing time in line at Jubilee. According to the Bible, the word waiting appears a whole lot more. For example, the word waiting appears twice, very early on in Luke's Gospel. And once it describes old Simeon, and once it describes old Anna, who were respectively waiting for the consolation of Israel and waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Luke 2.25, Luke 2.38. Furthermore, when we arrive at Jesus' own teaching of his disciples and their posture related to his return. He says to them in Luke 12, 35 to 36, stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Other times, when we see this word in Luke's gospel, the word for waiting, it, it takes on the flavor of a, even a quest or an adventure or an all-out search. So we learn of, of Joseph of Arimathea, the one who provided his own new tomb for the body of our Savior. He said, it says in Luke 23, 51, that Joseph was looking for the kingdom of God. So that word waiting there is translated looking for, as in inquiring, pursuing, on the hunt for the kingdom of God. So in Titus 2.13, we're to be waiting for the blessed hope. And yet clearly this, this waiting isn't just laying around. It's not just hanging out or, or twiddling our thumbs. It's far too active and employed for that. Some scholars suggest that the word waiting could be better translated expectantly waiting or looking forward to. I, I think that has a lot going for it. But I'll tell you that the commentator that takes the cake on this is, is Bob Yarbrough. Here, here's what he says about this word. Wait can sound like idleness or nonchalance, but the underlying word taps into a rich religious phenomenon characteristic of Judaism and early Christianity. It's a posture not of passivity in the face of a fickle future, but of dogged confidence in God and his sure promises, awaiting that is proactive and expectant. It's ready to jump in and hasten, if possible, the coming of what it awaits. This is the readiness called for by Jesus in view of the return of the Son of Man. And if you'll permit one more cited source here, listen to what Paul Tripp says. It is so good, what, what Tripp says about waiting. Here's what he says. Waiting on God doesn't mean sitting around and hoping. Waiting means believing that he'll do what he's promised and then acting with confidence. Isn't that good? 
That's what waiting for our blessed hope means in this present age. So all that remains for us today is to discover why this is such a blessed hope, such a happy, happy hope. In other words, to put it another way, why is the appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, worth waiting for? If you're curious, too, as to what the Bible teaches concerning the timing of the blessed hope, the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ with reference to what we call the tribulation, the final seven years of, of human history, well, hang in there because we'll draw some conclusions as we go. But regardless of where you might come down on the issue of pre-trib, mid-trib, pre-wrath, or post-trib, Here's the banner that flies high above the entire discussion. If your ultimate hope is in anything less than the blessed hope, raise your standards for what is worthy of hope. Three brief applications. Number one, for all who are in Christ when he comes, there will be no more suffering. That's first. For all who are in Christ Jesus when he comes, there will be no more suffering. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 to 8, Paul, the Apostle Paul, comforts a persecuted church by writing, This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief. You hear it? And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God or do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Now, there is far too much there in those four verses to possibly unpack. Just permit two surface-level observations relative to our topic. Observation number one. According to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, the return of Jesus results in the relief of the sufferings of his saints. I'll say that again. According to 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, the return of Jesus results in the relief of the sufferings of his saints. Observation number two. According to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, the same return that results in the relief of his saints also results in the destruction of his enemies. I'll say that once more as well. According to 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 to 8, the same return of Jesus that results in the relief of his saints also results in the destruction of his enemies. Initial conclusion, 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 to 8, is a difficult passage to harmonize with the pre-tribulational rapture. The rapture is the clear teaching of the Bible that when Christ comes, he comes to gather his church to himself, to resurrect believers, both living and dead, to be with him and relieved of both suffering and sinning forever. It's a glorious doctrine. The doctrine's not in question. The question is not, does the Bible teach a rapture? Of course the Bible teaches a rapture, a gathering, a snatching, a catching away of the saints to be with himself. That's not the question. The question is, what is the timing of the rapture with reference to the tribulation? And the preliminary answer from 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 to 8 is, it's not prior to the tribulation or even at the beginning of the tribulation. Now, regardless of the timing of the rapture relative to the tribulation, whether or not the church will pass through some or all or none of the tribulation, what every believer ought to be able to agree on is that for all who are in Christ, when he comes, there will be no more suffering. All 
sides agree on that reality. And this is due to what is far and away one of the greatest promises relative to the second coming of our Lord, and that would be the resurrection of our bodies. It's coming, friends. Consider Paul's words to the church in Philippi, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. In Philippians 3, 20 and 21, Paul writes, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await. There's our word again. We await. We await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. So very much of the sufferings of this present age are entirely wrapped up in the way that life east of Eden, living as we do in a sin-cursed world, affects our physical bodies. So much of our suffering is due to that. And if you're a believer, if you've been born again by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, you have a blessed hope. You have before you the happy, happy hope that when Christ comes, no more broken bones, no more aging, no more cancer, no more genetic disorders, no more cognitive decline or memory loss, no more heart disease, no more deafness, no more diabetes, no more pandemics. Now, if we had time, we'd turn to the great exposition of the nature of the resurrection body found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 to 58, but we simply must move on. But before we do, allow me to right the ship just a bit since I stacked the deck against the pre-trib rapture a moment ago. Let me take up this point this way and say that the pre-trib position is favored by passages like 1 Thessalonians 1.10, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. These verses promise that Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come and that God has not destined us for wrath. And while it's possible to understand a post-trib rapture in light of these truths, it's certainly more difficult. <laughs> if Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come, and God has not destined us for wrath, it's difficult to see how the church could possibly be on earth during the time at which God's wrath will be unleashed full force across this world in an unprecedented way. I had a recent conversation with our former associate pastor, Seth Brickley, who recently said to me, yeah, most biblical convictions that we hold are simply a matter of adopting the theological view with the fewest problems attached to it. And I think he's right. I, I resonate with that. These verses, some of them, are more subject, uh, su suggestive of a pre-trib rapture. In fact, I'm not even going to show you all the verses I found this past week. I found a stellar case for the pre-trib rapture and have nothing but respect for those in this church that hold that view. On the other hand, other passages in the Bible are much more suggestive of a post-trib rapture. They're very difficult to fit into the pre-trib rapture view. So what do we conclude? Well, my advice would be, let everyone be convinced in his or her own mind. And then regardless of your view, eagerly yearn and long for the return of Christ. Even if you believe we're going to go through all or some of the tribulation, don't wait around for the Antichrist. Wait for the Lord Jesus Christ. Anticipate and bank on your future resurrection. If your ultimate hope is anything less than the blessed hope, raise your standards for what is worthy of hope. 
I say that as a tentative post-tribber these days. For all who are in Christ when he comes, there will be no more suffering. Second application. For all who are in Christ when he comes, there will be no more sinning. For all who are in Christ when he comes, there will be no more sinning. Now, you have to have been in Christ long enough for your love affair with sin to have gone bad. But as I preach to you today, I know that for so many of you, it has. You are simply tired. You are tired of sinning. Me too. Now, some of you in our congregation haven't even gotten started yet. When you think about sin, you actually tend to wonder in the secret recesses of your heart what the big deal is. You basically see life in this moment as a series of restrictions and things that you are not allowed yet to do and that you can't wait to indulge yourself in when you're older. Or perhaps if you're older, you've developed a sort of double life. You know what I mean? You're nice when you have to be. You, you pretty well do what people ask of you, but when you have a little anonymity, when you have access to something forbidden, your appetite for sin is insatiable. And you're a hypocrite. You're not real. You may profess faith in Jesus Christ, but you do not, in point of fact, possess faith in Jesus Christ. Now that's not most of you. In fact, because I know you, the vast majority of you anyway, you are simply dog tired of sinning. You're aware of your sin, you grieve your sin, you hate your sin, you're learning to hunt your sin, and it's tiresome, and it wearies you. But regardless, until Christ comes, you are still indwelt by sin. And for that reason, you shouldn't be able to wait for Christ to come back. You're like that servant we read of in Luke 12, 36, who's ready to open the door at once, the moment your master arrives. Because you know, as 1 John 2, 2-3 to promises us, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Is that not glorious? When he appears, we shall be like him. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself, even as he, he is pure. It's amazing when you stop to consider just how frequently and relentlessly the New Testament appeals to the soon return of Jesus as the basis, in some cases the sole basis, for Christian ethics. Consider what Paul says in 1 Timothy 6.14, Keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or James in James 5, 7 to 9. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Be patient. Establish your hearts. The coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Or finally, 2 Peter 3, 11 to 13, Peter urges us in view of the soon return of Christ, what sort of people ought we to be? Living lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for, there's a word again, waiting for and hastening the coming day of God. Now, if you're in Christ and if you've been walking with the Lord for any length of time, it's passages like these that both comfort you and light a fire under you. Because you're real and 
you're tired of living for what Jesus died for. And if that's you, I want to encourage you to hang on. Hang on. This life is a vapor. Your blessed hope is coming, and he's coming soon. And if you say you're in Christ, but the truth of the matter is that if you are honest with yourself, you, in point of fact, are living for what Jesus died for, then I want to share you a scripture. I want to share with you a scripture verse that, that stood to attention in my devotional reading this past week. In 2 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 12, the southern kingdom, Judah, is urging the northern kingdom, Israel, to abandon their idolatry and to turn from their sin. And here's how they seek to motivate them. Listen to this. 2 Chronicles 13, 12. O oh, sons of Israel, do not fight against the Lord, the God of your fathers, for you cannot succeed. There used to be a Broadway musical years ago titled, Your Arms Too Short to Box with God. I'm not sure the quality of the show, but I can vouch for the wisdom in that title. It's true. Your arm's too short to box with God. And if you're within the sound of my voice right now, and if you're living for that for which Jesus died, I want to urge you not to fight against the Lord any longer. You cannot succeed. For all who are in Christ when he comes, there will be no more sinning. Praise God, there will be no more sinning if you're in Christ when he comes. Final application point today. For all who are in Christ when he comes, there will be a whole lot more of the Savior. For all who are in Christ when he comes, there will be a whole lot more of the Savior. Now, in view of the time, I can't do much more than simply afford to outline this point. I want to encourage you to look up and to meditate upon these verses that I've attached to this third point in the outline. They will richly repay your meditation and consideration. Maybe talk about them in your community group or in your family worship time this week. But I will flag one of these verses for our purposes. In in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus says to his disciples on the night of his betrayal, Nevertheless, I tell you, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I do go, I will send him to you. Now, the Helper, as we know, is the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit, not long after, descended. The Holy Spirit is God himself, the third person of the Trinity whose role it is to apply in us all that Jesus has accomplished for us. And this is such good news that Jesus actually says to his disciples, it is to your advantage. It is better to you that I go away because when I do, I'll send the helper to live in you. Over the years, I've heard it put this way, that the point of Christ's words in John 16, 7 is that the Holy Spirit inside us is better than Jesus beside us. And you know what? For the sake of our mission, for the Great Commission, the sake of our mission to be and make disciples of Jesus, that makes perfect sense to me. In this age, right now, the Holy Spirit inside us is, in point of fact, better, a better arrangement than Jesus beside us. At the same time, that does not overturn the fact that one day Jesus will be beside us. Jesus has promised that. Christ himself is coming back to this earth, personally, visibly, bodily. And on the one hand, it's an understatement to say that that will serve to be a massive encouragement to us. In fact, if your ultimate hope is anything less than the blessed hope, 
raise your standards for what is worthy of hope. There's going to be nothing better than the second coming. The rapture, wherever you place it, before, during, or toward the end of the tribulation, wherever you place it, the rapture is the best news in the world. We have no greater blessed hope than the future bodily presence of Jesus on this earth. It's the climax of the cross. It's the climax of the resurrection. It's where we should be looking, not backward to the cross, but forward to his crown ultimately. There's going to be nothing better than the second coming. One day, Jesus will return just as he left. According to Zechariah 14, 4, and Acts 1, 9 to 12, Jesus' feet will touch down on the Mount of Olives. He will come to sit upon David's throne, and it's going to be the beginning of the very best. Jesus Christ is coming back. I'll say it again. We simply have no greater blessed hope than the future bodily presence of Jesus on this earth. But if that's true, then the reverse is true as well. Test yourself. Is the following true of you? Do you have no greater grief in this life than the present bodily absence of Jesus Christ on this earth? I mean, it stands to reason, doesn't it? If you have no greater blessed hope than the future bodily presence of Jesus on this earth, then what about his bodily absence? Of course you don't want to suffer anymore, and perhaps you're tired of sin, but that's not the point of this point. The point of this point is to ask, is the single greatest grief in your life the bodily absence of your Savior, are you, like the early church, learning to cry, Maranatha, our Lord, come? One beautiful saint from church history who did live this way was the Puritan Samuel Rutherford. Rutherford was a Scottish pastor who was faithful to the Lord and faithful to his church, so faithful to the gospel, in fact, that it routinely got him in trouble with the governing authorities to the point where he was at one time exiled from his parish and sent to live in Aberdeen, Scotland under house arrest. And from Aberdeen, over a period of years, he never stopped shepherding his estranged flock. And he did so through a series of letters written effectively in quarantine. In fact, uh, the book, The Letters of Samuel Rutherford, contains 365 such letters. That's one for every day of the year. Perhaps you might pick up the book, the book and use it in your devotional life alongside your Bible reading. If you were to read through these letters, one thing that you would pick up on very, very quickly is that Rutherford loved to think about the blessed hope. In fact, that's not exactly fair. It's probably more accurate to say that Samuel Rutherford was absolutely possessed by the blessed hope in such a way that the doctrine of the bodily future presence of Christ nearly ripped his heart out as he considered the present bodily absence of Christ on the earth as he knew it. Here's how he put it in a letter to his friend John Gordon, written June 16, 1637, quote, I have much love sickness for Christ. If Christ's love, that fountain of delight, were laid open to me as I would wish, oh, I would drink and drink abundantly. And how drunken would this my soul be? I half call his absence cruel and a veil upon Christ's face, a cruel covering that hideth such a fair, fair face from a sin-sick soul. I dare not challenge himself, 
but his absence is a mountain of iron upon my heart. Oh, when shall we meet? Oh, how long till the dawning of the marriage day? Oh, sweet Lord Jesus, take wide steps. Come over the mountains in a single stride. Now look, you may not say it that way, but do you ever remotely think it that way? Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever pray the last promise of the Bible? In the final promise of the Bible, Jesus says, Revelation 22, 20, Surely I am coming soon. And the faithful church replies, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Do you pray that way? Here's a universal promise if you do. For all who are in Christ when he comes, there will be a whole lot more where that came from. A whole lot more of the Savior. Well, let's review. If your ultimate hope is anything less than the blessed hope, raise your standards for what is worthy of hope. For all who are in Christ when he comes, there will be no more suffering, no more sinning, and a whole lot more of the Savior. For in this hope we were saved, now, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and 25. Well, in view of the governor's order, we are permitted to gather in person one week from today up to 25% capacity of our facilities. Now, look, what that means in terms of numbers, in terms of attendance, in terms of numbers of gatherings, in terms of where precisely in the building we'll gather or how much of the building will be required for our gathering, protocols we'll seek to observe, and so on, all of that is yet to be determined. We don't know. Please continue to pray for your pastors and elders as we look to gather together and make decisions this week. One thing we do know today is that the next passage we intend to open up in this letter is, by God's grace, the final two verses of Titus chapter 2, with a sermon entitled, The Incomparable Christ of Our Mission. It's an exposition of Titus 2, verses 14 and 15. What a fitting, what a, what a providential passage for us to take up as we seek to gather for the first time in 11 long weeks in this place starting next Sunday. Lord willing, we'll pick it up then. But right now, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the fact that our times are in your hands. We confess we do not know all of the reasons or even maybe very many of the reasons for the season of this quarantine ultimately in your good providence. But we know because they have come to pass, this has been on your watch and you have been at work steadily, incrementally, encouragingly conforming us to the image of Jesus. And what's more, absence from one another has caused our hearts to grow fonder. So we look forward to gathering one week from today. And oh, Father, may that colloquial truth that absence makes the heart grow fonder, may it just make our hearts grow far more hungry for the return of Jesus. Lord Jesus, Maranatha, come. In your great name and for your glory we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.